where I argue the foreground really needs to make up make up for the dull background. Okay. So nonfiction. What about here? <clears throat> so if it goes there. Low on milk. I love you. This simple text message arrived while I was out for a walk with a friend and let me know that I needed to make a stop by the grocery store before going home to Sandra. Such events are so commonplace here at the end of the aught decade of the early 21st that their absence would be considered extraordinary. But this message arrived in 1995. The infrastructure required to send it cost on the order of $20,000 per month, and the only reason I was able to afford such a luxury was that I wasn't paying for it. My team at Novell was responsible for supporting this technology, and what better way to support it than to let my wife use it to send me shopping lists while I was having walkies. Five years earlier, I started to write, and never finished, a far future science fiction novel in which there existed places in the city where authorized users could send and receive huge amounts of information via a wireless network connection. When Sandra's one item shopping list arrived, I looked back at that story and felt kind of naive. Today I look back at it and think that the concept of a wireless hotspot was obviously a good one, and it's a pity I lacked the ability to pursue it beyond an unfinished manuscript. For 11 years, from 1993 to 2004, I worked for Novell in various positions attached to their collaboration software. I did tech support for six years, and that felt like wondrous science fiction at first, until I realized that I was living in the dystopian sort of story in which things go wrong and then go more wrong, technology fails completely, and people are horrible to each other. Oh, and after they're done being horrible, they laugh about it with their friends. For the next five years, I was a product manager, and that job also pushed the sense of wonder button. I examined what our customers were trying to do with their software, or with our software and their businesses, and then I went back to our engineers and encouraged them to invent a solution. Communication breakdown in the workplace? My team shall solve this problem using science. Of course, the inventions never worked exactly the way we imagined, and once the code shipped to our customers, it entered the realm of the more dystopian stories. Those customers were the same ones I worked with in tech support, after all. I believe that a good science fiction story will feel real while instilling a sense of wonder in the reader. At the end of the story, the reader's awareness will have been expanded, hope for the future will have been instilled, and the reader will want to go out and make the future better. I believe this because that's what science fiction did to me as a kid. This is what I brought with me into adulthood. This optimism and enthusiasm is of mine is what informed my career at Novell. Of course, my career at Novell informed me right back. The pressures of that career resulted in my creation of Schlock Mercenary, in which the universe is not the dark dystopia of a zombie apocalypse or late night tech support, nor is it the utopia of coding the perfect module while in the zone on 250 milligrams of methylxanthine alkaloids. Novell drove me to imagine a universe in which the driving force, the immutable law, was that there must be a punchline every four panels. Consider this. As much as we all love to laugh, given the sorts of things people will laugh at, is the universe of schlock mercenary someplace you want to actually live? Me neither. Still, people tell me that schlock mercenary science feels real while evoking a sense of wonder. Shall I blame Novell for that? Did that text message about milk and affection lead me to read, lead me to write about a network of teleportation gates being used to duplicate travelers for subsequent interrogation and disposal? And if so, how? It's not supposed to be used that way. Let me rewind to 1991. I was studying to be an audio engineer, and Jim Anglesey was explaining the purpose of the patch bay, which looks like a numbered grid of quarter-inch holes. It was designed, he said, so that the mixing board's signal path could be whatever the engineer needed it to be. With a few patch cables, the sounds coming in on faders 1 through 9 could be fed into fader 10 for a single application of reverb. All the stuff on faders 11 through 24 might get a different set of effects. Or perhaps those engineer-defined groupings could be used to create single points of volume control for different ensembles within the overall mix. Or maybe the patches could be looped, creating such horrible distortion on one channel that it crosstalks onto adjacent faders. Jim went on to explain the guiding design principle to us, and it has stayed with me ever since. Any piece of equipment that will only work in the way its designer imagined it working is not worth owning. For 1990s era mixing consoles, that means the designer puts in a patch bay because he doesn't know what the audio engineer who buys the console might need to do. The designer does know that he can't imagine all possible uses for the console, and so he creates a solution that allows a huge number of those unimagined applications to be imagined and executed with nothing more complicated than a head scratch, a frown, 400 milligrams of caffeine, and several pieces of wire. Fast forward to my career at Novell. In the software world, the console might be considered to be the computer itself, and the patch bay is the compiler that lets you create new applications. 
The head-scratching, caffeinated audio engineer is replaced with a software engineer. Also head-scratching, also caffeinated. Mm -hmm. And the metaphor is complete. But for all its elegance and accuracy, that metaphor violates the principle. This is because from the perspective of the software customer, the software should be considered the mixing console, and the end user plays the role of the audio engineer. This poor end user is trying to create an email group by subtracting the manager's group from the department group in order to limit the scope of what is going to be itself a career-limiting email. When this user calls the technical support team, he may very well be told, it's not supposed to be used that way. Unlike the console designer or the compiler designer, the software application developer thinks he does know what the user needs to do, and this developer has created something that turns out not to be flexible enough to solve a real-world problem. The user still needs this problem solved, though, so the feature is passed back up the chain to the software developers who code it into the next version. Note, I've, re I've resisted the temptation to dash off a pun on patch bay and software patch, because patches are usually free, but the addition of this feature is going to be bundled with a bunch of other enhancements for which the user is going to ultimately be charged actual money. I remember biting my tongue nigh incessantly for six years as I supported an application which looked, on the surface anyway, like a collaboration toolbox that would support all kinds of business process, processes that our engineers and designers had not anticipated. Email is like that, right? It has become as important to business as human speech, and it should be every bit as flexible. But in practice, the software still had limitations that were inflicted upon our users by the simple expedient of an engineer's blind spot. I heard, nobody will use it that way on several occasions, usually in the context of a conversation in which I just finished describing somebody using it that way. The hubris to be found among tech support folks is pretty impressive, and I was no exception. I hadn't actually met any of the engineers responsible for the product I was supporting, and yet I was convinced that they were completely sheltered from our customers and were themselves so full of hubris that they couldn't see, what they, see that they were building the products too narrow. If I were in charge, and I had absolutely no inkling that at a future date I would be in charge, I would make sure the product would do things that we didn't expect it to do. It's no accident, then, that you'll find the characters in Schlock Mercenary using things in ways other than their designed intent, often with humorous results. Just because I believe that good design will allow for that doesn't mean I'm going to write a story around good design. Bad design is inherently funnier. Unintended uses that turn out to be extremely dangerous, yet supernally functional, are hilarious. Probably the best case from the comic is the time munitions commander Andreasen networked the targeting optics of a hundred or so missiles and fired them in order to create a high-resolution tel telescope known thereafter as the Very Dangerous Array. On a related note, the United States military is investigating a system for deploying flying spy bots via missile. If they name it the Very Dangerous Array, I shall respect respectfully demand that they pay me handsomely to illustrate the field manual. <laughs> <laughs> Stop thinking about the future. I bought a Palm Pilot the year they first came out, and I fell in love with it. My only complaint was that I had to learn the graffiti handwriting system in order to input text into the device. I firmly believe that any system that requires the user to be re-educated for optimal integration is not user-friendly, but I also recognized that teaching myself graffiti meant that the device could be smaller and faster. The Palm Pilot did a few things very, very well. While at a technical event in South Africa in 2000, I spoke with a coworker about the problem. A keyboard wouldn't solve it because it would be too big. What I felt the device needed was voice recognition and a wirelessly connected microphone. My coworker said that both of those technologies were already in place but weren't small enough yet. I should point out that I was a product manager by now. I switched to departments in 99, my new team got absorbed into product management, and then there were layoffs. When the dust settled, the new director of product management pointed at me and said, you're in charge. Well, I was positively on fire with the idea of Bluetooth voice recognition. When I went back to my fell masters, the director and the vice president, however, I was told to stop thinking about the future and start thinking about the now. Goodbye, science fiction, hello, reality. I needed to provide direction for applications that could be developed today, not five or ten years from now. I should add that I was every bit as full of myself as I was back in tech support and actually imagined that I could imagine all the possible needs of our users. That I turned out to be right a lot of the time did not help matters any. <clears throat> Within two years, we were looking at the problems of integrating our server-side products with a wide array of handheld devices our customers were falling in love with. 
Arguments for and against handwriting recognition were passionate, bordering, bordering on religious, and thumb typing on numeric keypads was taking off among kids who really should have known better than to go driving, driving grown-up technology with their stupid trends. Note, I never learned to thumb type. It's possible I'm biased. During these discussions, it became apparent that we couldn't possibly integrate with all these devices, and there was no single standard programming interface, or API, where device manufacturers and software manufacturers could meet each other halfway. My team and I were told to bet on which device or devices were going to dominate in the coming years, and then write to those specifications. Now, I not only had to think about the future, but I had to attempt to predict it with no small degree of accuracy. True, whichever specifications we adopted would gain strength from our support. A best case result might be called self-fulfilling prophecy, but Novell just wasn't a big enough player in the industry to tip those scales. And while I had a pretty good track record for managing the feature set of the product, this was a whole new kind of problem. It was at about this time my team was introduced to the book The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton M. Christensen. Christensen's research shows that people profiting from established technologies tend to overlook or ignore the disruptive innovations that are destined to become the next generation's established technologies. Senior management pushed the material on us because they recognized that Novell, a company that was born out of some amazing innovations, was now merely refining old work. My fell masters wanted us to innovate again. Of course, my fell masters also wanted us to incorporate those innovations into the current core businesses so that current customers were happy and existing revenue streams were defended from the competition. You see that requirement right there? That is the innovator's dilemma. And the crux of the matter is that when faced with this dilemma, most everybody decides to protect revenue at the expense of true innovation. I freely admit that in studying that material and applying it to my work, I got it 100% dead wrong and 180 degrees backwards. I identified with the innovator when the decisions I was making were allowing the true innovators to make their way past me. This, woe be to my ego, is exactly the behavior that the book predicted. You should go read that book instead of anything I write. I can teach belatedly acquired humility. Clayton Christensen can teach wisdom. And so it was that in spite of being excited about the future and actually being told to think about it, I wasn't really being paid to create that future. I did exceptionally well managing the now by applying lessons from the immediate past, but that was the extent of it. We muscled our way out of declining revenues and made lots of nifty refinements for lots of good money, but we didn't revolutionize anything. The science isn't the story. Even though I was really good at my job, Employee of the Year 2002, I was also wrong a lot of the time, and it wasn't just me being wrong, sometimes the whole team was wrong. Often the entire company was wrong. I could make the case that in many cases the entire industry was wrong. One common theme in science fiction is that society's ills can be solved through technological advance. Breakthroughs in medical technology, starting with wash your hands after handling corpses, you idiot, save millions of lives each year. Automobiles are a lot better for our cities than horses were, and what comes next may be even better. The information age is teaching us that it's not us and them, it's lots of flavors of us. These and other examples encourage the great minds of every generation to build better mousetraps in order to save people from the plague. They also build better encryption algorithms to save people from identity theft. But the typical technological solution is just as typically no more a treatment for a symptom. The underlying problem remains unsolved. Consider the fact that dishonest people wish to defraud others. Better and better encryption systems may make your social security number safer, but they do little to reduce the base human desire to take something that doesn't belong to you. Consider the case of the ill-conceived email message, that career-limiting move in which the writer rants about management's latest bit of mismanagement and then sends the message off to a dozen people, <laughs> accidentally CCing the boss. Our product had a neat feature in it, allowing that message to be retracted from the mailbox of any recipient who had not yet opened it. This feature generated two types of calls. One, I sent an email I shouldn't have sent, and I retracted it, but not before Jane read it. She forwarded it to the boss. She shouldn't be able to do that. Two, I got an email from an employee. The subject line had obscenity in it, but before I could open it, he retracted it and it vanished from my mailbox. He shouldn't be able to do that. The problem here is not that the retract function was imperfectly coded. The problem is that sometimes people in the workplace will vent their emotions in inappropriate ways, and coding around that is what we like to call a non-trivial problem. With one customer, I discussed a hypothetical solution. 
What if the program read what you were writing as you typed? And what if, when it thought you were being stupid, it held the message for 10 minutes before sending it? I was being facetious. Of course, the customer loved the idea right up until we realized that somebody else was going to have to define the definition for stupid and program it into the very machine he'd been calling stupid for the last 40 minutes. This brings us to another common theme in science fiction, although usually the dystopic stories. Society's ills cannot be solved through technological advance, and often technological advance only makes it worse. These stories resonate with me because I saw enough examples of this at work to know the principle to be at least anecdotally supported. I believe the truth in these themes lies somewhere between them. There are problems technology can solve, there are problems it can't solve, and there are problems that only technology can create, like automobile drivers texting while driving, and who then accidentally strike pedestrians who are also texting. Welcome to the 21st century. At least you are less likely to be killed by a runaway horse. When I write, I take all of this into account. It's fun to tell a story where science saves the day. It's also fun to tell a story where science dooms us all. But my favorite stories are where people interact with other people, sometimes saving them with science, sometimes saving them from science, and since my main characters are mercenaries, sometimes dooming them with science. But the science isn't the story. Sure, I spent hundreds of hours at Novell studying the technologies I was supposed to be supporting, and I studied again to try and learn the shape of the markets into which those technologies were supposed to be sold. But the real lessons I learned were from guys like my director, who kept telling me, you can step on their toes, but don't scuff the shine of their shoes. What does that even mean? Well, sometimes, in order to make something happen, I had to make somebody else unhappy. Maybe I needed to end someone's pet project to make budgetary space for strategic new features. Note, these may have been cases when I was stifling innovation in favor of revenue. We will never know. When that happened, my director's advice was to allow that person to walk away with as much of their pride as possible. Maybe it could be summed up as don't add insult to injury. That was just one of the many lessons I learned. Corporate politics may sound cold and heartless, but playing it well and being effective involved being genuine and friendly rather than pulling rank in order to make things happen. My hubris, my ego, and my passion for technology all had to be set aside so that I could learn to be a nicer guy. Only then could I really get my job done. I learned to see things from the other person's perspective. I learned to consider people's feelings before trying to address their concerns. And I learned to apologize even when I still knew I was right and they were wrong. Those lessons, most of which I'm still learning, informed my writing far more than any of the technology I touched. Stories are not about science or society or settings. Stories are about people and how science, society, and setting affect their relationships with other people. Sometimes the epic tales show people changing their society and setting with science, but the very best stories always, at their core, are about people. Sandra emailed me to remind me that I needed to write this essay. I mused upon the approach I would take, and I remembered that low-on-milk message while at the gym. I moved plates of metal back and forth to compensate for the fact that my modern lifestyle does not need me to be able to run an antelope down in order to eat. And this essay's outline began to unfold between sets. I headed back home ready to write and decided to call Sandra to apprise her of my schedule. Exactly. I pushed a button on my Bluetooth headset and said, call home. Oh, know, my phone followed my instructions um, perfectly. Hi, honey, I'm on my way home. I think I'm ready to tackle that essay. Oh, good. How was the gym? Fine. You need me to get you anything while I'm out? Well, we're low on milk. So, that is the, that is the nonfiction piece. <laughs>